Ruben, so thanks for your time. It's, it's great that you could spend the next uh, hour with me to tell everyone about what you do in your career, how it's progressed, and also give us some industry insights. So if we could just start off, could we tell the audience who you are and why they should listen to this, this video? Sure, easy. Like I would say, great. Thanks for uh, having me. Uh, I'm Ruben with a uh, Dutch name Spruit with a rolling R. For the US colleagues, for non-Dutch speaking Sprite, Fanta Coca-Cola Sprite is, uh, is close to that, so that's fine. <laughs> uh, I'm a technologist uh, at Nutanix and um, joined Nutanix um, through the acquisition of Frame uh, a little bit more than two years ago and active in the EUC space for, uh, I think, two decades, um, both community side, business side, and personal side of business side is uh, like sort of integrated into each other. So we'll talk about that probably for sure. We'll see. Awesome. And so where, where did your career start out? How has it, how has the journey been for you? Mm. Yeah, an interesting journey. And I think it's important to, uh, to focus on the journey and not so much on the sort of finish line. Uh, if you enjoy the journey, uh, that's always healthy and, and good. Um, journey started, um, long time ago. Uh, I'm married 22 years, uh, have three kids. So um, yeah, active in this space for, for a while. And I started uh, in IT uh, through just uh, high school. Uh, my dad uh, uh, was active or yeah, he is retired right now, was active in IT. Um, and that's how I rolled into IT. So I always had computers and stuff to build and stuff to repair and everyone in the family know how to find me. And especially in the early days with uh, like coax cables and Novell and uh, mm -hmm. like the uh, DAWs and like the early days, it was, uh, yeah, it was common that people uh, find me uh, to fix stuff or sell uh, disks and computers and like, yeah, that kind of stuff. So that's how I roll into IT. So education, IT education, uh, technical degree on that side. And then I rolled into a uh, startup um, company my dad owned. And that's how I rolled into uh, in IT as um, sort of consultant in the earlier days, uh, as an SE in the earlier days. That's how I got into sort of touch with Citrix and WinFrame 1.5 uh, a long time ago. And... Um, yeah, after probably six years or so, I um, I left, which was not easy. If you are part of the company your dad started, and then leaving a company is um, was tough. So it took a while to make a decision. Okay, I will I will leave, because I sort of um, felt I was outgrown that um, that part of the career. Then I joined an an um, system integrator. Uh, worked there for 13 years, started as a consultant, uh, solution architect, CTO. Um, many people ask, what is CTO? Maybe we can talk about that a little bit later when I finish the uh, sort of career progress. But I joined uh, that company uh, for 13 years and then left, uh, had different roles and uh, made a lot of progress in that uh, company, but was ready for a new adventure and joined an, um, yeah, something new, a startup in Silicon Valley focused in the software divine storage uh, space. Um, that company got sold, then I joined Frame. Frame got sold, then I joined uh, Nutanix and that's where I am uh, right now. So always active in tech, um, EUC mostly, but um, well, we both know that EUC without sort of um, backend knowledge uh, and general IT knowledge um, is tough. Uh, and especially in the early days, I was uh, also like Exchange and SQL and AD and like all the sort of backend stuff. I uh, I mastered that as as well. So I still like uh, to be feet on the ground, hands on, build stuff uh, in uh, home labs and in uh, public clouds. Um, so although yeah, I've been in different sort of uh, leadership positions, it's always good to know what you're talking about and stay uh, stay close or closest to. Uh, to the real stuff when you advise colleagues advise customers uh, advise community uh, yeah it's good to yeah to stay grounded let's call it like that yeah definitely i think i think about like the day-to-day -day of ruben right so the day-to-day -day of what you do right now what oh, yeah. look like and then we could probably then go on to what what a cto actually does right from your position yeah so yeah day-to-day day -day is uh no day is the same here. And that probably applies to, uh, to many of the listeners, but 
that's what I really like in this role and in the previous roles as well. It's um, it's a mixture of um, like tech, connecting with engineering uh, people, connecting with customers and partners from a tech perspective, um, sometimes helping with troubleshooting, uh, bridging between customer and engineering, um, but also uh, sort of sales related, which means like jump in in important sales meetings. Um, it's also sort of marketing related, jump in and sometimes lead uh, with marketing efforts. So it's a mixture of tech, sales and marketing. And that's how I would describe uh, like an external focused CTO. Some people call that field CTO. Doesn't matter how you want to call it. Some people call it technologist, doesn't matter. It's more external focused with strong roots and strong connections to internal. Um, there are also other type of CTOs which are more internal focused and closely or closer to engineering and developers. Um, but I'm more external focused. That's what I do in Nutanix. That's what I've done in the previous uh, like startup and also in the um, system integrator role. So yeah, yeah, that's what I that's what I do. So it's very diverse um, and that's challenging both uh, challenging like eh, challenging but also like hooray great challenging so yeah it's uh it's uh it's an interesting role i like i really like that yeah i think diversity is key right i think getting different challenges and different things to work on keeps it, make, it makes it makes the job feel as if it's new all the time yeah. rather yeah. Than you're just doing that mundane thing over and over and over again uh, yeah and, and also although like Nutanix is uh, like is a large company right um it still feels in the role I have as well to sort of be part of a larger startup uh, and not the startup in the frame days or prior to frame uh, with a very small team, like 100-ish colleagues uh, or even less. Uh, so it's a large, much larger company, but yeah, because it's still very diverse and you see uh, like impact um, directly or maybe a little bit later, but you can see the like the, the impact it has. That's what I what I like uh, in this uh, in this role and also in this company, to have the flexibility and freedom to fill in that role uh, for uh, yeah for the UST group. Cool. And what what would you say is the most memorable moment you've had in your career today? Yeah. To be honest, I'm not so good in these type of questions, uh, and that's <laughs> that's that's not a, that. I learned, uh, so I had some coaching lessons a long time ago. And what that coach um, did learn, I will also, I'll, I'll answer that question for sure, but I wanna share some lessons I learned in that context. And that coach uh, learned, uh, did share and, uh, and I learned to stand, sometimes stand still and just enjoy the sort of um, achievement, which can be small, can be very small, or can also be very big. And the challenge I had, and still have a little bit is that I, I'm always like looking forward, like looking ahead mm -hmm. and not standing still and looking maybe a little bit uh, backwards, like, hey, what did I achieve? And celebrate that success. And what she learned in that coaching um, sort of project is to stand still and celebrate success. So sometimes maybe you know that sometimes I use like the uh, mojito hashtag and mojito for me well, it's a good, it's a nice drink. I like mojitos, especially when it's uh, sunshine, but it's also like, okay, celebrate success. Small, could be personal, maybe with the kids or something with friends or can be big. Um, that's why like hashtag mojito for me stands, okay, celebrate uh, success. And like memorable uh, moments um, during my career, um, uh, for instance, like being part of the Microsoft Value Professional Program for 14 years mm. um, is, well, is tough uh, because it, that involves a lot of community work, which is not tough by itself because I enjoy doing that, but it just consumes a lot of time. And that is not always the, the easy part of that. Uh, so 14 years in that program is, um, yeah, is an, I think an achievement. Um, let's see. Um, in the little bit earlier days of, uh, of Citrix, I was part of a very small group who did like the C Citrix CCIA uh, was an, like a practice exam I did in Fort, Fort Lauderdale. And there were, there were probably a handful of people in the whole world who, who had that certification and who did the practice exam in the earlier days of, uh, of Citrix. Um, that was special. It was not easy to achieve that. 
Um, but well, being at, in Fort Lauderdale and Citrix headquarters uh, was great. Um, let's see. Well, with, with Benny, with Benny, um, was also cool. It was the uh, Microsoft Ignite uh, session, probably four, maybe five years ago. A uh, super large auditorium, 4,500 people could fit in that auditorium, live stream, and then talk about uh, like uh, EUC in, ge in general. Uh, that was it was great. So yeah, these are topics I can imagine right now, top of my head. Oh, and, and writing a couple of white papers and books and the impact of that is also uh, is also big. So Smackdown white papers, I think I wrote five of them. Some of them were sort of converted to books I need to hand out. Yeah, that's also... Uh, Good stuff, and that these white papers, to be fair, is not an um, a Ruben show or so. It was really a team effort with also a lot of other co colleagues in the in the PQR days, and, um, and we did also kind of other kind of um, spin-offs of community efforts like uh, virtual reality check, project VRC, uh, VDI like a pro, uh, Appvid Guru. I remember um, the one that we did with the tweets in the book. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's also a nice one. Yeah, exactly. Like Twitter style. Uh, what was it? Twitter style best practices um, uh, in a book. Yeah, that was also a cool one. Yeah. So yeah, when I th think about it, there are a lot of uh, cool moments. Yeah, I agree. One of my most memorable moments from my time sp spending with Citrix, right, was actually finally getting to meet Mark Templeton before he stepped down as, as CEO at Citrix, right? Because I was very fortunate to get there. Be I think it was like six months before he stepped down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very, very fortunate to meet him and listen to some of the. Yeah, the yeah. Bright, uh, bright guy and honest guy and great guy as well in many levels. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And yeah what would good. you say is the biggest mistake you made and the lesson you learned from it? Um, yeah, what I what I learned, I wouldn't say mistake. It's tough to say that as a mistake. Well, maybe it is, but. To say no more often is what I learned. It's not my strong position to say no, to be fair. Um, especially when it's like part of like sort of your, what you like to do. Um, but if you know it's, it's too much, like too much stuff already on the plate, say no is also a great, uh, a great art. And I don't master that art well, to be fair. So say no during my career um, is, uh, is challenging. That has impact also in family life and I'm fortunate and blessed with a great wife who brings me back into sort of balance when I don't say no too often. Uh, so she helps with that. Um, so what I learned is, um, yeah, how do you call it? Um, don't take yourself sort of too serious. Uh, <laughs> enjoy life. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not like a clown. That's not my style, but um, sometimes I can be a little bit more should be a little bit more relaxed and uh, don't take myself too uh, serious. That's also what I what I learned. I'm not sure if that's a career mistake, yeah, per se, but still like lessons I I learned myself uh, during the years. Do you think over the years you've made any sacrifices? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think that if I think about that, so just another lessons I learned. So. I, I well, before COVID, I traveled a lot, like really a lot. Um, like the folks from KLM, they congratulate me by um, achieving platinum status after five months in a year. And I wasn't sure about that. Like, hey, is that something to celebrate or the other way around? Because the sacrifice of that is that you're not at home, but you're in like an, uh, in a bus, like an air bus eh, or a Boeing bus, whatever. Eh, but um, so the sacrifices I made are mostly connected to a family. Um, and one of the lessons and one of the rules I, uh, I always have and had is uh, be home when the kids have their birthday. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like my rule one. Rule one applies. I will not be at VMworld or Ignite or Synergy or Kickoff when my kids have their birthday. So and that's the rule. But for instance, when the kids have their um, like a special event at school, that didn't apply to rule one. Mm -hmm. And if there was a big event or if there's a customer engagement or whatever uh, required to travel. Yeah, that's like the, that's where I think about sacrifices uh, on the family side. So yeah, I for sure uh, wasn't always at home when uh, I should be or when I needed to be. Um, that's the, that's what I think about sacrifices. And I think many of us in this space who are like really active and passionate about 
um, spend a lot of time on that, they probably are in a sort of similar boat or same ocean uh, from that perspective. And, yeah. and um, to, it's, yeah. it, is, it is on one side very simple to say, hey, family first. And that's like my rule, family first. But what if you are being requested to be on stage at a big event like Ignite uh, and present something you're passionate about? And by presenting, you're offline for like three, four, five days and you're in, in US. And exactly in that week, uh, something at kid school um, is uh, is is happening. What do you do? Yeah, both, That's not both easy. Once in a lifetime opportunities, right? Once in a lifetime to see the kids doing something, but then once in a lifetime to, do, to speak at Ignite or something on those lines as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's like where... the, that's that stuff. And um, on, on one side, making these sacrifices made me what I am right now uh, from a human being perspective, but also the position I, I have. Um, and the kids and also like the family, they understand, okay, yeah, this is like the, the downside of uh, their downsides and, and, uh, and, and like pros and cons on, on, on that. And um, yeah, sacrifices are like the, the cons on, on that. Yeah, I like and also the sacrifice, you can also learn from that because especially now when there's no travel, um, or for me, there's no travel. And for many of us right now, there's no travel. You also sort of um, reflect, not sure if that's the right word, but mm. hopefully people understand, reflect like, hey, maybe that travel experience last um, like three, four months before COVID was, uh, was too crazy. And uh, I will not go back to that sort of crazy travel mode. Well, I had weeks where I was in a Schiphol for like three days in a row, one day, Monday on uh, back and forth to, to Paris, Tuesday back and forth to Munich, uh, Wednesday back and forth to London, and Thursday and Friday packed agenda with other meetings. Mm -hmm. That was uh, like way too crazy. And uh, I will not go back to that, uh, to that mode. It's being recorded. So if it happens, you can play back the, I can play back the recording and you can uh, help me uh, remember that, uh, that statement I just made. Yeah, definitely. I think the, the key to all this is, is getting a family and a wife and things that, that are going to support that, that lifestyle to an extent. And then also, I think it was Case this morning saying that um, he, he doesn't see it as sacrifices. He sees it as choices yep. um, because totally agree. to do these things um, and it's never a sacrifice because it then potentially then enables you to have the life that you, that you have today as well. At the same yep. Time. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cool. And if you were starting out again, right, so you were going to be giving yourself some words of wisdom, some three top tips, right? What, what would you say to yourself um, to, to focus on? Good question. Yeah, I would say don't be scared to find a new adventure uh, is my top tip. Um, it feels comfortable or it is comfortable to just do what you do inside your company. Um, and find a new adventure can be done inside your company or like that's if I just um, like reflect on my career that happened that that large like system integrator I progressed and pivoted and find, found new adventures and also unlocked new adventures myself in that company and that is important to sort of um, just grow don't uh, settle and just rest and, and relax um, yeah sometimes it's good to rest and relax but like being passionate also means just like, okay, just do it. Uh, like roll up the sleeves and get stuff done. So top tips is roll up the sleeves, get stuff done, just do it. That's one, um, find new adventures um, and don't be scared what the uh, impact is. Of course, it's good to think about the impact. Uh, I did spend quite some time on my glass board, my whiteboard, when I switched from the system integrated role to the startup with like a lot of with a lot of risks also attached to that but also a lot of rewards or potential rewards attached to that is also in a, a great tip um, and a tip if if i like uh, uh, maybe the tip is focus on something focus on something specific specific and make sure that you master that uh, that like focus area whatever that is if it's uh, like you see dash gpu ai like there's there are many items uh, on that side and also make sure that if you have focus on a certain element, that you know also sort of the generic topics around that element. So, uh, and especially when you start your career, um, it's good to be more broad than like extremely level, like level 900 out of the 900 uh, deep. Um, but if you progress, it's good to have a certain focus area um, and have like a, larger, a broader uh, scope on, uh, on topics you've mastered. 
Yeah, definitely. Has there been any points in your career where you feel like you've been pushed to the to the limit, right? The breaking point where you thought, right, that's it, I quit, it's over. And then you've managed to talk yourself down from that situation and then you've overcome it, right? Has any of that has that ever happened? No, not not really. Um but in my career, it's two things. In my career, uh, I had um, multiple opportunities where uh, sometimes competitors, but also complete other companies uh, reach out to me like with a question, hey, do you want to work for us? Mm -hmm. And I always, um, I always responded like, hey, let me think about it. And sometimes that, that process took five seconds and say, okay, I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that process took me a couple of days or weeks to think about it and have a chat with family and friends and also community peers about that. And then, okay, am I, am I ready for a next jump or a new adventure? Um, and yeah, and sometimes the answer was yes, or a couple of times the answer was yes. And I pivoted from like the system integrated to, uh, to the startup uh, world, not because I wasn't happy in my role. Uh, um, like, hey, I want to quit this career at all. No, it was just ready for something new. Like I sort of, met the plateau okay i like i'm done i i know how this works i've seen this i've seen this okay i'm ready for something new and if that happens we talked about that just uh, like a couple of minutes ago then yeah if an opportunity uh, um, arises just well yeah why, why not what can you lose and um, especially if you're young or younger or if you're older and you feel young why not uh, age is just a number so just pivot and uh, and change and roll up the sleeves and get stuff done and um, so how did you overcome it? Just do it, make it happen. Nike. <laughs> yep. And, um, so we, we take a, a walk towards the industry, right? And we think about the industry and the way it's changed um, since you started out. What do you think the biggest change has been? Um, yeah, in the early days, it was, um, if I think about it, it's like, um, software became service in the early days we just downloaded software we used tapes and floppies to get access to software and now have we downloaded the software and now you know, we consume software as a service um, in the early days it was like a lot of build your own especially in the early early days hey, you build your own pc and i still do but that's another conversation and now hey, more often you consume um, services you consume resources we consume you assume um, like platforms. Um, we just talked about this, the book and the Smackdowns. In the early days, it was much more like, hey, just keep all the information yourself. And I think nowadays, um, it's still like some people do, but I have from, from the start, I believe that sharing information is valuable for yourself, for your own career, uh, career uh, development, for your personal branding. But in the earlier days, I got a lot of sort of almost negative feedback from colleagues or even sort of customers, partners by sharing feedback, by sharing insights. Like, why do you share all this like VDI knowledge or this GPU knowledge? Why not just keep it for yourself and just use that knowledge in your consulting practice? And like, I believe that like keeping knowledge doesn't, doesn't help us, doesn't help you. And sharing knowledge makes a lot of sense. So in the past, it was just keep knowledge um, and I think it's very common to share knowledge. And although knowledge sharing is, is different, huh? we had books and big white papers in the past, then we had blogs, and now it's more blogs and social, which, uh, which is also sort of knowledge uh, sharing. Um, let's see what else. We talked about travel. Uh, in the past, it was um, more like local. Huh? My, like, uh, my region here in Netherlands or Netherlands, or maybe like Netherlands and Germany as an example. And nowadays it's like, it's global. Um, we, we talk right now, like I'm in Netherlands and you're, you're not. So it's easy to communicate. Uh, time zones are less important. Um, so that's also changed the industry and how we work and how we consume resources, how the career is developing. Um, and also like what is also changing, you, you make a lot of new friends um, yeah, while being active in the uh, like community, and uh, I think the EUC community is in uh, is a great community uh, with a lot of um, cool, smart people. Um, and yeah, the world is feels like getting smaller as well. Um, 
it's easy to to meet or easier to meet normally, uh, which is which it should be. It's easy to connect, uh, which is healthy. It's easy to share. If you have an issue, uh, I can try to help you. If I have an issue on tech side, like you help me with certain uh, items like there is is easy to uh, to connect and many people are willing to uh, to help and that's uh, that's just easier uh, compared to in the past yeah i think um the biggest thing for me especially with communities it's got it's got to be reciprocal right so you can't just be the taker you can't yep. just keep for example if i just kept messaging you saying ruben i've got this problem ruben i've got this problem ruben i've got this problem at some point you're going to turn to me and say thanks kyle but no <laughs> because it's, yeah. it's, it's Meant to be a two-way thing, right? Meant to learn off each other, not yeah. not just be the person that's consuming all this stuff and being that that private person that isn't sharing. But I mentioned just uh, like two minutes ago that uh, saying no is not my strong uh, stronghold. So yeah. before I say no, it will take a while. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, so all good. But you're gonna get flooded with tweets and mess instant messages now. Yeah, it happens like uh, daily, uh, weekly, uh, and uh, like. I, I would say I, I respond to all of them. Sometimes I don't know the answer. And if I don't know and I find it interesting, I try to find the answer because I also want to know. But um, yeah, it just takes time, but also helps in just uh, getting more and more knowledge around uh, certain topics. Yeah, I think if you think on like interests, right? What, what, what technology is piquing your interest at the moment? Um, yeah, good question. Um, G GPUs or graphical processor units, not only for like EUC, VDI, DAS, but also for um, like AI, machine learning um, analytics is what I found, not specifically the GPU itself, but also like the complete ecosystem around it is what I found find, find interesting. It's an art on itself and it's an industry on itself. So it's not simple like, hey, just uh, spend a couple of hours and, uh, and you master that. But I find it very interesting um, sort of technology segment. Um, cloud computing in general um, is very diverse. Uh, we just, with VDI, EUC, DAS, we just uh, use a segment of what is possible in cloud. Uh, so cloud is what I also find very interesting. Um, in security, I also, like I'm not a security expert, uh, like some others are like really an expert, but I find it intriguing to, uh, to see what is happening in that space, how technology is evolving, um, yeah, also cool stuff, which uh, is uh, interesting for me. Yeah, definitely. And I think, um, do you think there's any like unsung heroes of technology, right? So I, I use the example of Microsoft Flow. Okay, so in, in the hands of, of even a, a user, right, you could automate a business process using drag and drop kind of functionality. And everyone has access to it with their office subscriptions, but they generally don't know it's there. Is yeah. there any unsung heroes you can think of? The, the an interesting one is uh, I like it's it's not really well it's technology I like uh, like Grammarly, mm -hmm. like if you type a lot as non-native speaker, which which I am, uh, as you can hear obviously, um, like Grammarly is a great uh, a great tool to just help in writing, and um, we ha we have plans in sort of uh, writing a new uh, EUC book. When timing is right, you will uh, hear or uh, see that uh, being uh, being shared. Uh, but Grammarly is uh, is really helpful in um, in writing just better uh, content. Um, when you think when I think about unsung hero, um, I would say like everyone, maybe everyone is a hero. It sounds a little bit strange and maybe a little bit abstract, but everyone has something they're not tweeting about, um, and that can be family wise, can be uh, like personal history, uh, relationships, bad things happen, like many things can happen, right? And I, I was on a sailing trip uh, two weeks ago uh, with nine, uh, nine other guys. This has nothing to do with EUC in tech, by the way. But um, what I found interesting is that when you listen to the personal stories and if you're on a boat for five days, yeah, you drink a beer uh, or a couple of beers, but you also have like really personal um, like conversations. Um, and it was great to see like man being open, sometimes crying about what's happening, uh, what happened in the past or what's happening right now. So yeah, everyone is fighting a battle they're not tweeting about. Um, so that for me, an unsung hero can be like a, a great friend of mine uh, who has uh, health issues or who got an, um, um, yeah, Maybe he has like I don't know, like two years to live because he has a brain cancer or like and that and that's and how they handle that that for me is an unsung hero and that's not 
attached to technology, but um, yeah. keeping that away from technology is yeah. is, um, is is definitely something that I think the younger generations struggle with. Right, everything's shared yeah. on social media. Every, yeah. media Every, everything seems to be shiny and Instagram ready, and <laughs> yeah. if you just uh, uh, punch through that. Yeah. You, uh, you, I, me, we, uh, we are like many of us are heroes. And if you just spend time and listen to the personal stories about that, yeah, it's something I can really uh, appreciate. Yeah, I like, I like that concept. Yeah. Um, so, it, do you think there's any any areas of, of technology and customers that are just undervalued or under under uh, invested? Yeah, a couple of them. Um, so many of us are in the boat of like a cloud first, mm -hmm. but I don't believe that cloud first is a, is the best strategy. I believe that uh, cloud smart is a much better strategy. And cloud smart means, okay, hey, what is the workload? What is the use case? What's the timeline? What is the knowledge I have? Um, um, and use that to build what I believe for many organizations is much better is a hybrid cloud infrastructure. Um, where you have on both sides, like on-prem and public cloud, the same skill set, the same type of people, the same knowledge, the same tools to manage uh, and, and, and run like on-prem and public cloud, which requires a modern, like like called on-prem co-location, like a modern data center. Um, doesn't mean that that everyone fits in that bucket. No, there are companies with like full focus on public cloud where it makes sense. There are companies where with more focus on on-prem. But longer term, I believe that both like both worlds are like sort of balancing. There's a reason why Amazon and Microsoft are shipping, delivering, uh, developing also on-prem uh, solutions like Azure Stack Hub as an example or AWS Outpost because they see there is a uh, market and there is demand for on-prem as well. There's a reason why VMware and Nutanix are sort of um, connecting on-prem with public cloud and building a hybrid uh, scenario because, well, that's where the sort of balance is as well. Mm -hmm. So my point in that, uh, under, under value is like modernizing your existing data center uh, mm -hmm. is undervalued. A lot of people think, well, hey, okay, let's forget all about that and just move to public cloud um, because that cloud first is a strategy. And maybe it's good to stand still a little bit and think about, okay, what does that really mean? And maybe uh, be smart with cloud, uh, cloud smart. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that, definitely. I think there's a lot of people that, that jump at the gun to, to do something with the cloud because it's what everyone else is saying that they're doing. And it's not necessarily what they are actually doing. It's just a buzzword. It's been thrown around a C-level table, potentially. Yeah. Um, no. And, 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 and like for sure, like uh, public cloud and cloud services like are like key, and that's where the growth is. And that's where like my, that's when Nutanix started like as a cloud service. So, no sort of negative words about that at all. That's not my point. But hey, be smart. Uh, frame is not the, isn't the holy grail for anything. So is on prem not the holy grail for everything? So find that uh, like middle ground and be smart with uh, with cloud and cloud services is what I. Yeah, definitely. I think. We think about the biggest driver on that that smart decision matrix, right? It generally comes down to cost, right? Cost, payment plan, is it the right location? Is the service there, the latency, and all those other things that come in? And I think that people don't, like you say, take a step back and think about the ecosystem that surrounds just delivering cloud yeah. in whatever form or guise that might be, and how they then put the the, the foundations in to make sure that it's going to fulfill the requirement that they're after. Yeah. So that's cost, no cost is one side, but also especially these days, agility is uh, like even is, is also um, like very important. Mm -hmm. um, if customers only focus on cost and don't see the other values yeah. uh, or don't spend time in investigating the other values, like a hey, time to market can be very valuable. And it can be sometimes attached to like, hey, what's the like, uh, is that hey, what's the uh, value and price for for that? So that uh, brings back to, to cost. But um, What's only focusing only focusing on cost like uh, reduction uh, can be also very dangerous uh, user experience can be used huge uh, be impacted by okay focus only on cost i think um, the question that i ask a lot is well what's the cost of not doing it right so if, if if we take the current pandemic that we're in right now right where supply chain was was non-existent you couldn't get 
servers and storage and equipment and whatever reason because of the demands on on chipsets and PSUs and whatever else that was holding yeah. the manufacturing the only place that people could then do is burst into the cloud right? and we all saw Microsoft come out saying all these regions now have no available space only blue light services can have <laughs> infrastructure right now because we can't really fulfill all the demand yeah. Yeah. and I think that's a that's, that's a great eye opener for people as well whereby everyone kind of thought that cloud was this infinite pool of resource right that was never going to get maxed out and it came very apparent within a few weeks that that, that just wasn't the case that means yeah, or, or or like the another uh, item some many people don't know is that it's um like if you want to have guaranteed um resources mm -hmm. um for instance like in in azure there is um right now there's no option to have guaranteed resource availability even reserved instances don't provide you provide you that guarantee what I, that's what I what I know. Maybe they changed it or they will change it. Uh, that would be great. Um, so if cloud is part of your disaster recovery strategy uh, and business continuity strategy, then okay, what does it mean if that guarantee is not? Uh, and 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 how like how often is that guarantee being applied? Is that real or is it just uh, like on paper? That's like also a big part of that uh, sort of cloud smart conversation. Yeah, I know when that, that message that came out saying there was no resource and things, I was sat there thinking, right, I better power down my demo environments right there in Azure for yeah. no apparent reason. And then I thought, oh, I need to do a test. And I wanted a, yeah. an MV series machine. And I was like, I'm going to find somewhere in the US that has it. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it was good, good hunting, should I say. Mm. Yeah. Um, so on, on the point of the pandemic, right, there's been there's been positives and, and negatives to this, this whole situation that we're in. And I think if we just focus on the positive side of it, because there's too much negativity around this entire situation. Um, what would you say the positives are that you've seen? Yeah, no travel, family time. Yoo -hoo. That's a positive <laughs> thing for sure. Um, uh, more active in uh, like gym, walking a dog, these type of things is also a positive thing. Um, overall getting more done uh, compared to the past are the positive things. Um, I would say the downside is the mental uh, impact. Um, I'm just generalizing right now, but I can also bring it to myself, like being active in this sort of uh, cube, well, it's a little bit bigger than a cube, but my like working space is great. And I'm like fortunate to have a, an, our own, my own space uh, with well equipped stuff, but it's still my space and like spend like 10 hours, 12 hours uh, in this room um, and no connection. Like we are built, we are made, we are born to, connect with each other and that's not really all oh, that's happening right now but that's still different right and that has mental impact for sure um i know also that if you're need to sh if you need to share a room and if you have three young kids uh, screaming around that's okay for a couple of days couple of weeks but if this like is months and months and months yeah it has impact in relationships has impact in just uh, like well-being and as an sort of colleague as a manager as a leader that's something we should be really clear on. Okay, uh, that can have huge impact just in uh, like people with burnouts and mental uh, issues, and can also translate in physical issues. So great to work from home, but uh, I think it's it's healthier um, to have and balance like work from home and uh, like be in the office uh, or meet colleagues at events. Um, that's a healthy sort of balance, which is out of balance right now and. It will take time, but we'll get back into in sort of balance, whatever that balance will uh, will be. I think the, the the key thing for there for me is is moving forward, right? As we come out of this pandemic at some point, um, is choice, right? Uh, giving people the choice to go back to the office and to work from home. And I know personally, right? I I, I have the capability to work from home, very much like yourself, but an office with equipment and all those kind of things is fantastic. But I would still want to be in an office one or two days a week. Um, yeah. yeah. Social I mean, maybe or, maybe that's just an idea like what if the office becomes the new clubhouse mm. like you go to the office to socialize and not to get work done and you stay at home and you work from home to get work done and use the office like a day in a week or maybe two days uh, a week mostly for stuff you could, cannot do on your own at home uh, socialize um, brainstorm meetings um I'm more creative when I just meet uh, others uh, inside Nutanix or in the, in the community uh, and new ideas come into sort of uh, flourishing by sometimes drinking two beers on a bar. <laughs> Not sure if it's bar or beer, what the reason is for that, <laughs> but 
yeah, uh, it, it helps when you connect and um, share ideas and, 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 and brainstorm and discuss about, about that. That's helpful. Yeah, yeah I think that, that's for me. I, I look back to, to when we were in offices and, and I'm kind of sat there thinking that the bit that I really miss the most is being able to, to whiteboard properly because doing it with technology is, is not the same but whiteboarding properly and then sitting there with someone looking at it and then them grabbing the pen and going up and scribbling something out and putting a line in here and doing that kind of scenario. And I think that for me, it just gets things done quicker in that kind of scenario rather than trying to do it as a shared whiteboard on a technology where yep. Yep. whatever you draw looks like a dog. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Perfect. So let's go on to lightning round. Okay. So let's, let's learn a bit about Ruben. Um, <laughs> last technology purchase um, BMW R90 Glamsec edition ah. which is nothing to do with EUC or IT but it's a nice uh, nice bike I, uh, I bought it uh, three days ago actually yep. yeah I went I went the opposite route I went out and bought a Harley Davidson oh cool yeah also good stuff <laughs> yeah um, who's your biggest inspiration um I like to read uh, books um, and like biographies from like uh, Elon Musk and Satya Nadella are like top of mind. Um, so that's inspiration. Um, but I also like, and that's a complete non-tech topic. I like to read the Bible. So Jesus for me is also inspiration, but um, nothing to do with tech. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's for me. Okay, good. And what does work-life balance mean to you? doesn't exist let me explain because i don't believe in work-life balance i believe in work-life integration mm -hmm. and if we uh, integrate if we are able to integrate it well um and sometimes it means you're out of balance to use that word yeah. um that's uh, i think that's a good thing and that's where like family is important to have to make sure that the work-life integration is uh, is well balanced let's put it like that yeah, yeah definitely that makes that makes a lot of sense and what did you want to do when you finished school? Oh, it depends which school uh, and which age, but uh, I would say uh, Marine Corps, uh, pilot, IT. Marine oh. Corps and pilot didn't work, uh, so I entered in IT. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like, a, I spoke to a few people, everyone's kind of gone down the route, I want to be a policeman, a fireman, and then... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we mentioned before, so I'm going to say, ask you your favorite book. Yeah, um, um, Phoenix Project, um, Unicorn Project, and uh, also Mark Rusinovich, uh, like Microsoft Azure CTO. Uh, he created a lot of books, tech books, but also a couple of, uh, of novels. So if you look at uh, their no his novels, um, yeah, good uh, good stuff. It's tech. It's um, yeah, it's good stuff to uh, to read. A lot of it on there, like cybersecurity protection, NSA kind of things, isn't it? Yeah, yep. yeah, good good yep. books. Yeah. Um, most important thing to you? Family. Yeah, uh, default answer, everyone's too yeah. afraid anything else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and again, finding that balance, we talked about that earlier. Uh, everyone uh, says family first, but yeah, if it's like really, okay, if this is important, family first, no doubt. But what if you get a request to present at an event, 4,500 people, uh, like uh, audience. And yeah, if you, if the if my kid's birthday happened, like no go, but what if it's, uh, a little bit smaller, but still sort of important, right? Mm -hmm. Then making that decision is not uh, not easy. And then we talked about sacrifices. Well, uh, we talked about choices. Uh, that's a better better phrase. And then, okay, what do you do? Um, yeah, but family at the end. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Family and health is is the main answers that yeah. I see more people say. Yeah, yeah. Um, what would be your words of wisdom if it was a tweet? Um. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, these days, uh, maybe two, um, like two tweets. That's fine, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, if you're grateful, it's hard to be grumpy. Yep. Um, especially like these days, like work from home, sort of limited in some degree. If you just like feet on the ground and see what is happening around us. And uh, if you're in IT with EUC knowledge, we have, a, we have plenty of uh, work to do. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a good salary in general in IT. So I think there are a lot of things to be grateful for. 
uh, if you're healthy, if you have a good relationship in your family, there are a lot of things to be grateful for. So it's totally fine to be grumpy. Som sometimes I'm grumpy, like, I okay, uh, it's back to my office again. Mm -hmm. um, I do miss X, Y, and Z. But then, okay, look around, and there's so much to be grateful for, so it's hard to be grumpy. That's, um, yeah, I think that's one uh, sort of tweet line. Uh, the other one uh, I use a lot um, is, like, if you do what you love, then you never have to work a day in your life. And if you can pursue that, and that doesn't mean that every day is, like, happiness and hallelujah, that's that's an, that, that's not, re not, not reasonable, but if you can pursue that, and so far I'm able to do that, um, then back to that word grateful, then I'm a blessed and grateful guy. Yeah, and I think the, uh, at the end of each of those tweets, right, hashtag mojito at the end. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well spotted, well learned as well. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, favorite song? Good question. I, I don't have a specific uh, repertoire of music. I like pop, top 40, rock, um, gospel like all kinds of places they're, like they, they're always sp specific songs for specific moments right uh, like a couple of brian adams songs brian adams um it's a name the song is like everything i do i do it for you is in a song i uh, is close to my heart that's the first song when i uh, met uh, Jacqueline, my my wife uh, let's see 30 years ago three zero years ago um yeah i was young when i met her uh, and that's uh, yeah, it's a good thing. Happy with that. So that's a special song for uh, for me. Perfect. And fill in the blank. The new normal is not normal. Should not, <laughs> should, should not be normal. This is at, this is the new abnormal, and uh, I'm looking forward to an like uh, I would say normal. Uh, normal is uh, we have uh, interaction, we have uh, social connection, we can hug each other, we can kiss each other. That's normal. And um, some people think this is the new normal. Well, there are elements for sure which will become normal, yeah? like working from home for many of us. Like, for instance, family close to me, um, they were not able to work from home. Yeah? They, well, technology wise, they were not able. That's check solved. But also organizational wise, they're not able. And nowadays, like, they, they, they must work from home. So when sort of normal is, uh, uh, is restored, I know for sure uh, my, uh, my brother and uh, uh, my cousin they will have a conversation in the office like, hey, if they get feedback, hey, you cannot work from home anymore. Why not? We work from home for like nine months, six months, 12 months, whatever the time is. So that work from home, the technology being used, the mindset that, that, you, that you can work from home and be productive, um, that is, uh, you can call it that new normal. That's a uh, great learning uh, experience for, for many of us. Uh, but the new normal is abnormal. The new normal should be social, connected, um, kissing, yeah. hugging, uh, discussing. Drinking. Uh, that's that drinking, exactly. <laughs> that's the new normal. That's that's normal, yeah. And, uh, must watch TV show. I watched uh, documentaries. Um, I like uh, Black Mirror, uh, which is not really a documentary, it's a TV show. Um, I like that one. It's uh, strange, annoying, interesting, scary, yeah. cool, like all in a lot of uh, episodes. Um, so I would say Black Mirror, um, although scary stuff happening there as well uh, on Netflix, a Netflix uh, series. Yeah. yeah, it's a great, great show. Um, yeah. So many twists and deviations to what life could be. Is the I also like the uh, sort of um, like Master Chef, uh, Barbecue Wizard, like all these type of uh, yeah. like food related uh, shows as well. Um, there are many of them. Um, I like them. I like to cook. I like to barbecue. It's uh, it's a sh mostly short, like forty minutes, forty five minutes. There's food, there's people, there's culture, there's travel. Like many things are involved in these type of shows. That's what I like. What I like about these uh, these shows, or documentaries. Like can be anything. Can be like financial stuff, uh, bitcoins, um, uh, defense. Like can be like all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, and leading on from food, actually, last question is uh, favorite junk food. Um, Ooh. I'm not really into junk food. I would say bitter ballon, that's Dutch stuff, but it's not that I eat that uh, weekly, uh, but that's considered junk food for sure. Uh, Coquette is in the same sort of uh, arena. Yeah. Um, I'm not, I like burgers, but not like the burgers from the, like the, 
restaurant restaurant the golden circle or like whatever you want to call it um i like to bake my own burgers it's a junk food if i if i make them not really uh, but uh, <laughs> once in a while i do um and then yeah i enjoy that for that point in time but um, i'd rather bake my own burgers or make my own fries for that yeah, fantastic. Well, I think on that note, I'm, I'm pretty hungry, so I'm going to grab some food. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time. It's been fantastic. Thanks. Thanks for asking and thanks for your time. See ya.